consumption based automation. I'm here with the leading uh, orchestration tool C2, and I will add the multi orchestration tool. It can do much more. And my guest is no other than Phil from C2. And maybe Phil, you can introduce C2 as uh, all the that all the extra ones that it. I know it has a great uh, orchestration tool. What is C2, and who are you, Phil? Yeah, great questions, and thanks for having me here, Anders. Um, so C2 is an automation orchestration and management platform. It sits on top of existing RPA estates, Blue Prism, UiPath, Automation Anywhere, Power Automate, the list can go on. Uh, the idea is that we deliver the outcomes that automation programs initially provided as guarantees to their business, the ability to take the work that people are doing and uh, complete it without people. Right? And we know that as your automation program scales, you have needs to manage better orchestration and scheduling of the work. You have needs to manage the operations that occur in the background, the level one, level two efforts to keep the robots moving forward. Our platform takes care of all of that and it realizes the true promise of automation. Myself, I've been here for just under a year. Um, prior to coming to C2, I spent 13 years in the automation ecosystem at Appian, which was in that low code space and has RPA as a component of their IA platform today. And today I lead our global sales here at C2. Nice to hear, Phil. And uh, also a shout out to the viewers who watched this session. We have A. Sullivan with us from Dublin in Ireland. Please let us know where you joined from and if the sound is okay. I hope so. Phil, I can hear you loud and cloud, but uh, let us know in the chat if there's something uh, missing there. And when you say Appian, uh, does C2 support that? Yeah, so C2 actually has got a really interesting approach, a best of breed kind of ecosystem player where we allow you to use kind of a universal queuing capabilities and integrate with a number of different external platforms. So we found ways to take uh, a number of either competing or complementary technologies and bring them into that C2 orchestration lens. Um, so looking at whether it's an Appian, a Pegasus system, some of those more traditional like BPM or low code platforms, or if it's maybe just more proportionally oriented directly towards RPA, uh, really trying to be a single pane of glass on top of and a good architectural citizen to partner with each of those technologies in an enterprise. So you can either do all the big RPA tools. That was also what we saw in the demo. You could do UiPath, Automation Anywhere, Blue Prism, and as we hear, Appian, and, and much more. I'll also link to the demo in the chat. So you shouldn't go there now, but there's a C2 live demo. If, if you want to see the tool in action, there's a link here, and you can join that, or you can watch it after this session. We also have Assis here, and we have Mohammed from Morocco. So nice to see you. Keep introducing yourself in the chat. And the topic today, that is pay-as-you-go automation. And Phil, maybe you can briefly introduce pay-as-you-go automation. And because I don't know a lot about it, of course, I know the term, but uh, suppose that I'm uh, 15 years old, what is pay-as-you-go automation? Yeah, so automation, stepping back, what is what is kind of intelligent automation? Obviously, it's a maybe a confluence or the integration of different automation technologies into the idea of something more like a utilitarian stack. This can be RPA, it can be IDP, it can be ML capabilities, it can be more traditional workflow like a BPM, um, chatbots, all of these different technologies kind of play together inside of the way that business processes are executed with the idea of pay as you go automation. What we're really looking at doing is providing automation as a utility or a service so you pay for what you use um, really for that 15 year old kind of listening and trying to understand what that means you think about it in the context of flipping on a light switch and flipping off a light switch um, when that electricity is powering the appliances in your home you're paying for it and when it's not you're not um, the complement to that would be or maybe the counterpoint would be that you know traditionally licensing forced you to buy ahead and look towards maybe a larger scale of what you would hope to achieve and you would typically pay for more than you used over a period of time, whether you were buying a number of user seats or whether you were buying a number of digital workers or whether you were buying a number of CPU cores you wanted to deploy your software across. Um, you would typically use the, the little part of it at the beginning of your engagement. And over time, you would grow your utilization as the value um, emerges from the product. Consumption based pricing just kind of flips that on the head a little bit and it allows you to just ramp up and use only or pay for only as much as you're using great so it's like my fitness uh, membership that right now i pay it uh, monthly and if it was pay as you go i could just pay whenever i show up and all these months where i don't show up uh, which uh, unfortunately occur then i wouldn't have to pay anything is that correctly understood 
That's that's correctly understood. Yeah, it's a good analogy. The the kind of number of minutes you spend in the gym would be the number of minutes that you would be billed for. And if you wanted to do different activities at the gym and be billed at different rates, rather than paying kind of a flat monthly fee, you could pay per minute to use the bars or per minute to use the treadmill or per minute to use maybe a lap pool. Um, and you might pay different unit costs for each of those different capabilities. So it really allows you to create what has become a bespoke way of engaging with different technologies. And it gives you flexibility to take on only as much as you're ready or prepared to use. And where would you typically see this pay as you go? Because uh, wherever I go in the automation space, uh, I always pay like a subscription based. I think I have a subscription to Power Automate and I know this also exists in UiPath. You have to pay, pay these, but where do you pay uh, these uh, kind of consumption based? Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting. Consumption basis is uh, a little analogous to transaction based pricing, which has existed for a long time. We're used to pay per case or per you know number of invocations, per number of web service queries. Uh, the difference here is that I think we don't we don't tie the unit down to the work that's being completed. We tie the unit down to the thing that's completing the work. So we can look at um, you know the idea of RPA as an example, and we can say if you have a digital worker that runs 24/7 for you know 52 weeks, then you're effectively using 100% of that bot. Well, that digital worker might only be running for 20 minutes at the end of the month to kind of process the end of month close. In that case, you would be looking at 240 minutes of use rather than, you know, the 365 days of 24 hour use Um, consumption based as a a platform for or rather a pricing and packaging metric is something that I think more of the enterprise vendors are starting to look at as their customers are asking for it, as their partners are asking for it, Um, really trying to find ways in 2023 to create more operationally lean businesses to um, realize cost savings in you know, a period of time where we're being forced, all of us, to find those cost savings. Um, pricing and packaging models like consumption-based pricing are becoming more common, but they're still not um, something that you can walk into with most software vendors, most SaaS vendors. To your point, you're going to commit to, at a minimum, maybe a monthly rate per unit, whether that is per user or per digital worker. Um, and then, you know, I think across the IA ecosystem, you're oftentimes forced to buy a lot more than you're prepared to use. If you look at the idea of something like uh, you know intelligent document processing, you might only be ready to take a couple hundred or a couple thousand pages a month through an IDP engine, and you might be forced to buy 60,000, 100,000 units of pages that you're just not prepared to scale to. So I think customers are asking for the SIs that we're working with. They're certainly excited about how this can unlock more of the OPEX of their customers to drive innovation back into their programs. And certainly I think vendors are starting to listen to it, but it's not commonplace. And certainly for a full IA platform, which is the integration of all those different technologies, it's something that we haven't really seen anyone else doing today. And uh, I also want to say to A. Solomon says the sound is is real good. And O. Vibosity say, he say hello, uh, Dave. Is that you? Dave is the C2 user from the, from the last stream. I think I reckon his uh, his nick. Maybe he's here, in here in disguise today. And anyway, welcome to Webosity or Dave, the RPA guy. And uh, Phil, you, you mentioned that usually the intelligent intelligent document processing that was um, like a subscription based kind of fee. Um, so if I'm a small company and I want to do pay as you go uh, document processing, where should I look and uh, how should I orchestrate it? Sure. Well, I think you have to step back and try to understand what the broader programmer vision is. So, you know, I think setting a goal as an automation outcome is better than stepping into a product and trying to find something to do with it. For years, I I sold a technology that an enterprise would have and they'd have the capabilities to use, but they wouldn't have a project front door or a book of work that really predisposed how they could realize value from that type of platform. So understanding what type of outcomes you want to drive for the business, how you want to innovate and modernize is step one. And then as you look at and you recognize there may be a potential for intelligent document processing, IDP, uh, to complement or to materially change the way that you're orchestrating some work inside of your business, um, you look to companies like C2. So with the Consume platform, we've taken and integrated all of these different, like I said, IA technologies into a single almost marketplace or ecosystem where you can select the ones that you want to begin to maybe experiment or play with, or maybe move into a full-fledged production state. 
What it allows you to do, though, is it allows you to quickly adopt new technologies and drive towards innovation much faster than the traditional models. You're familiar with the, the normal model of procurement or the third party risk review process, right? And having to go to, uh, you know, a TPRM or a third party vendor due diligence team internally, go through all of the technology due diligence, potentially go out to tender, uh, go through the contracting, all to bring in a technology that six months later could have been saving you 500,000 pounds or $500,000 a month. Um, that's a long tail in innovation. And so with that IA marketplace concept that we have that pay as you go platform, it really allows you to take these new technologies, deploy them quickly and, uh, and get value from them on day one rather than on day 180. Uh, great, thanks for the explanation, Phil. And Webacity was indeed Dave, the RPA guy with the wrong account. Dave is um, is a C2 fan. His company uses uh, C2 and uses uh, a lot with uh, with Blueprint. He told us in the last session, and um, he also runs a, a, a fairly big YouTube channel. I can definitely go uh, check that one out. And Phil, uh, I assume that when you say consumption based, and this is, since this is a topic, I can get started with C2, uh, not having to pay a subscription. Is that correct? Yeah. So in in the consumption based platform, we actually use C2 as an orchestrator for all of the RPA that's deployed on there. So as you come onto the platform, you can quickly start building new processes inside of the RPA tools that the platform provides. Um, C2 used as that scheduler to manage the orchestration of work behind the scenes. And again, because it's that pay as you go model, you're really you know short of whatever you're using the the amount of time that the bots or digital workers are running. Everything else is just a cost that we absorb so that you can come in and come out of these environments to do the work that you need and pay for only that amount. There's no upfront, um, you know, long term contracts or or higher obligations for you as a customer. Uh, it comes down to the, I think, a monthly billing at a per minute rate. That's great. And that's something uh, we might not see from some of the other uh, uh, participants in the market. Maybe we could talk about the different participants because we we have the the vendors and we have the customer like me maybe the small customer very small customer but we also have some bigger customers maybe you can talk a little bit about the participants in this market who they are and what they want yeah and you know i think coming back to what what's the value behind consumption based you know as a as a mechanism for pricing and packaging we could talk about ia that's a separate conversation but for the pay as you go model on top of an ia platform Why do customers, why do integrators, why do uh, you know, why do our prospects we're speaking with have an interest in this model? A few different things. One, I mentioned that flexibility, right? So they can come in and scale based on their actual needs versus what some vendor has as an end of quarter target and is trying to push or sell to them. Um, you know, two, they can manage those costs accordingly. So they can look at the way that they're allocating budget for a program and only pay for, you know, as the program ramps, what they're using during the beginning of that program's life. Uh, the innovation, I mentioned the ability to quickly pick up and deploy new technologies and integrate them. And I'll give a, a quick customer story there in a second, but how you can maybe an RPA, a state that wants to integrate IDP into a few of their processes, how they can quickly do that with the consume platform that C2 provides. Um, the customer success, you know, just generally speaking, I think it follows a lot of these different levers. So then as you talk about what are the different customer types, who's looking at uh, technology and and pricing and packaging capabilities like this, you know, I think from small to large, there are a number of different reasons that customers adopt this. One, we actually just spent some time working with. Um, they had a lot of seasonality to their business and they needed to be able to burst the capacity of what they were doing uh, when they either got to end of quarter or when maybe the volume changes. You can think of certain industries where this might be more prevalent than others. In the US, our healthcare system follows an open enrollment schedule. So at the end of the calendar year, you typically see you know significantly higher volumes, 30, 40, 50% of their annual business come into a six week window where transactions need to be processed. Um, you see the same thing inside of kind of the housing market as mortgage rates go up or down. So as mortgage rates have climbed, then the um, the number of applications coming into a mortgage lender have dropped significantly, in some cases greater than 80%. So the processes that are managing those in the background, now you have much lower utilization because there's just lower volume of work to be done. So that seasonality of business is a great use case for any customer profile, whether it's that small organization, whether it's a midsize or a large enterprise. Um, that's definitely one of the things that we're hearing from our customers. And another one that I think I kind of got back to a little bit earlier is just the 
they want to be able to move quickly. And so they're as an automation team, they're operating side by side with an IT organization who wants to control the technologies that are being deployed or maybe, um, you know, go through a much longer process to bring new technologies in and on board. And they want to get speed to value much more um, efficiently. So they were able to take our technology platform and quickly integrate IDP into some of those existing workflows without going out to a much longer process of procuring hardware, provisioning it, training and setting up an administrator to run the systems and then going only, you know, n number of weeks later and starting to deploy the actual work. Um, they were able to do that in a period of days through that C2 Consume platform. Great, Phil. And when you talk about this pay as you go pricing, um, do you have any minimum usage required or can I just start as a very small business with the C2? Um, is yeah, there anything or, is that, or do you have any fixed cost? No, the, I mean, there there are fixed costs depending on a few of the things that you might select inside of that IA platform. Like if you want to deploy a chat bot inside of a workflow, then it's it's not a per minute, it's a per chat bot type of use case, but we're able to kind of fractionally deploy those chat bots. So the costs are significantly, um, you know, they're, they're marginal to what you would see if you went through more traditional commercial channels. There's no commercial minimums for engagement, though, on that consume side. So if you're a small business and you want to quickly start playing around with and deploying, uh, you know, some RPA inside of maybe a team or inside of, you know, a family office. You can absolutely do that at, at no risk, right? Again, it's only however many minutes that you use in production that you're going to be billed for, and that's on a monthly basis. So you have tremendous control over your own costs, just like you would if you're using IaaS. So if you're in Azure, if you're in AWS, and you're you know, spinning up and spinning down instances or infrastructure to support your enterprise, you have that dashboard that shows you how much you've spent over a period of time. It allows you to forecast how much you'll spend through the end of that period based on your current usage and utilization. We give those same capabilities to our customers. So it's very easy to start. It's very easy to understand your growth and to see what the costs are along the way. Thank you for the answer. And Mohammed says hi in the chat. Uh, hello, Mohammed. Nice to see you you here and if any of you uh, like this session please give it a thumbs up that will make uh, c2 the c2 live uh, show go out to more people and we can have we can have more like this and thank you and phil um, how do you calculate uh, this cost so let's say that i start with c2 and i want to set up a, a couple of processes in two different tools how will you calculate the cost yeah, so I mean, the first thing that we kind of step back and we talk about is you know, not the cost, but the business case. What's the value to the enterprise for this approach, whether it's C2 or whether it's this consumed platform that gives you much more kind of far reaching IA capabilities through a pay as you go model? Um, we want to help the customer understand what the value to their business is. So we can look at the total overall cost of an RPA estate today. That's the number of automations you've deployed, the cost of the license for the bot or the digital worker the cost of your infrastructure to maintain and run it, the cost of the FTEs that are providing the level one, level two support. And we can provide some benchmark business case that will show you what your immediate savings will be. It's a cost takeout just to bring C2 in as that orchestration layer on top of automation. We then look at, okay, so you've been doing this inside of a UiPath or inside of a Blue Prism. Let's look at your utilization. Let's look at your metrics. Let's understand the number of processes, how and where they're deployed. Um, you know, and then we can go ahead and effectively map that over to this consumption based platform and share if we were to either build net new processes or migrate more of your estate over to that pay as you go model, um, what the cost delta could look like. And, and typically what you find is that where customers have uh, much lower utilization, they have that seasonality of business, they have high infrastructure costs, they have high level one, level two support costs. Um, we have tremendous savings over those models. One of the things that I didn't mention earlier in this IA marketplace, this, this platform that we've deployed, is that um, not only do we provide the capabilities to you know, deploy IDP, ML, RPA, chatbots, and more, uh, but we also wrap it with this white glove service delivery. So we've partnered with an organization, Unite BT, that's helped build out this managed service platform as a service delivery model. So on the platform, it's running a ServiceNow instance so that we can manage and track the work queues between our customer and then our service delivery team. And then we do have that white glove service delivery support that can provide businesses even more value for you know, keeping the automations working and reducing their own manual effort and costs. We have a number of integrator partners that have adopted this platform with that same model as a managed service. 
And so in each one of those different ways you look at kind of deploying this platform, whether it is you're just taking the technology and building it on your own and, and keeping the lights on and running a team, or whether you're partnering with one of those MSPs to bring this in is really much more of kind of a service delivery opportunity. Um, you'll realize different types of, of business case or different types of value streams. And, uh, and we can really help customers cost out and understand what each of those models is based on how you want to use it. Thank you, Phil. And Dave, our friend, says that I may have missed this. Are we talking about C2 professional services helping companies to implement this kind of stuff or C2 hosting these pieces? Maybe you can take a step back and explain what these two are because yeah. uh, Dave clearly work inside uh, your excellent uh, suite. That's a great question. So just as a statement, C2 is a software company that has no kind of background in um, or interest in, we have the background, but not the interest in building a professional service organization and uh, and being a consulting arm to our customers. We want uh, them to partner with the integrators that we partner with as well. These are either boutique consultancies or larger GSIs that provide uh, RPA, C, you know, the RPA implementation, the process design, automation, execution, and then the run side of that business if they need like a level three type of run. Um, that's not C2. C2 is the software to uh, orchestrate and manage the automations. And then um, on the platform side that we provide as a hosted offering, we're building the infrastructure and managing more of the kind of the background support to make sure that the automations themselves are working. So the professional services that I referenced, they're really more that white glove service delivery is in the context more of a managed service. And that's provided by our partners, um, typically as a package or an offering that they might bring to market. Great. Thank you for answering. And thank you, Dave, for the great question. Keep those uh, nice questions uh, coming. And maybe I have a question, uh, Phil. So let's say that I want to start using, uh, in this case, the leading tool, C2, in the market. And I are there any costs related to setting this up? Do I need to, you said professional services, boutique consultants or something like that. Do I need to hire consultants for, for setting this up? And how big uh, of, a, of an expenditure is this? Yeah, so I guess it depends on where you are in your automation journey, right? If you've already taken automations on-prem and you've deployed them inside of an RPA tool, then we would look at either just kind of stapling your on-prem environment side by side with this new uh, IA uh, platform where you're going to be deploying and building net new processes. Or if you want to move the things that you've built from on-prem over to this, this cloud-based model, uh, we would work with you to migrate those processes. In the latter, kind of, you know, migrating those things over, it's minimal level of effort. And it's something that, you know, with our, our delivery partner, Unite, we can typically work to bring those processes on board very quickly um, without a heavy statement of work or any, you know, real you know, investment from a services organization. If you're talking about now, I'm an organization where RPA or automation is new to me and I want to start building on this platform for the first time then yeah, you would either look to engage in you know an, an SOW with a delivery organization that can help you build the automations, or you can go through the training, pick it up and build them on your own. Uh, that's the only real kind of cost of implementation that you'll see here is um, you know, building net new automations or migrating them over. And in the latter, because we're using synonymous technology, whether it's your on-prem version of a Blue Prism or whether it's one that we're running on the C2 Consume platform, um, that's the same core automation in the background. So migrating that over is a very simple exercise. Great. Thank you, Phil. And I also think that me as a tech, fairly technical person, we saw the demo, which you can find up in the chat. Uh, it's also in the video description of the C2 platform. It seemed very easy to to use, like if you have a basic knowledge of queues and, and these things and schedule triggers and all this, it seems fairly easy to, to get started at least. And I know there's a, a lot of great documentation. I'll also say that if you want to know more about C2, they got a great YouTube channel, which I will post the link to here in the chat. You can just uh, click there and then uh, subscribe to that uh, channel. Then uh, we have Stina joining from Troil. She's actually up, upstairs in in this house. So uh, that's uh, in the family. And then we have another question that is in music. How does C2 compare to Camunda in terms of compliance and local deployment? Maybe you know, Phil, and maybe you don't. Yeah, so fair question. I mean, the first thing to separate out is that Camunda as a, as a open source BPM platform is going to solve different challenges than C2 is. If we're talking about the consume platform that we deploy, which has a number of different technologies in there, um, and you want to look at either the compliance or, and in terms of compliance, I'd have to 
unpack what that is a little bit more, if that is regulatory compliance, if that's compliance to your organization's IT or InfoSec policies, if it's compliance to data privacy and residency. Uh, but we have each of those individual technologies on the platform, whether it's Abby for IDP or UiPath or Blue Prism. And we could talk about what the individual capabilities for compliance with those tool sets are. Um, in terms of how we manage it at our level um, as a platform, as a service that we've deployed, it's deployed inside of a SOC 2 accredited, ISO 27001 accredited, or um, you know, kind of infrastructure with really strong InfoSec policies in place that allow us to onboard regulated industries in markets like United States, uh, United Kingdom, uh, across uh, you know, Western and, uh, and other parts of Europe. So we've had some real good success, I think, proving out and as achieving attestations of compliance with that platform, uh, but being more specific and kind of mapping point to point with a platform like Kamun, it could be tricky for me to do on this. Thanks for the answer, Phil. And it's Mick, please let us know in the chat if that uh, answers uh, the question here. So um, we talked about who, who benefits from this model. Can you say something about who will not benefit from a pay-as-you-go channel? Is that the people who utilize their licenses to the maximum, or who should not go with a pay-as-you-go uh, plan? Yeah, you know, I think the first thing to state is that pricing and packaging commercially in software, there are different models for different customers every single time. Whether I was selling, you know, a platform like Appian to a large enterprise, or if I were selling you know, maybe a, a SaaS product for managing your mail automations inside of Google Mail to uh, small enterprises, uh, you can create different models based on the ways that your customers are buying. I think the first thing that you're taught is, you know, sell your customer what they need, not what you want to sell them. And so um, in that vein, we can provide different creative commercials that enable the right size customer to adopt the product for the right reasons to them. Um, if you look at maybe the ways that you know, I think we've architected the approach to um, just selling the, the automation in general. We're really trying to look at and listen to the market and understand how they want to buy and use, um, whether it is an individual technology or product or whether it is the full platform, whether it is you know, how we implement a small bundle of uh, processes or maybe provide uh, more kind of guidance and advisory services around utilizations and, and health checks and audits. Um, it's targeting the solution to the buyer and, and what they want to buy. Um, maybe it, I, I'm going to have you ask that question again, because I feel like I went off off sideways there and didn't directly answer it. And I want to take another chance to answer that one head on. No, it's just that. Uh, so who should not go with the, with yeah, the pay yeah, as sure. you go pricing model as a customer? So I think you answered that. Um, and well, um, Maybe, yeah, maybe just to say one thing though, yeah, so I think the point that I was trying to make is that um, every customer probably has a use case where pay-as-you-go is suitable for a component of what they're doing. Um, it may not be for their full enterprise, it may not be for you know the way they're running their North American business, it may not be the way they're running automations for a business unit, uh, but they, they likely have some need or some use cases for pay-as-you-go. Like I mentioned, it's not, this is not a cost control exercise by itself. This is providing flexibility, providing that speed to innovate and bring new technologies in quickly, right? Um, but it also allows you to create greater efficiencies from the ways that you're using the things that you've purchased. So when you ask like who's not a good fit uh, off the face of it, it'd be someone who's using, you know, highly utilizing their license estate. Um, I heard this analogy when I was talking about this problem last week, and there's an internal colleague of mine who, who you know, coined it, so I won't credit myself to it, but uh, analogous to kind of renting a car versus owning a car. If you're going to be driving your car a couple of days a week, uh, you should probably own it. If you're going to need to drive a car once a month, you should probably rent it. And if you look at the way that AWS over time, they started with kind of deploying EC2 instances, and then they had on-demand instances and reserved instances, and then they had uh, reserved instances, on-demand instances, and spot instances. And the idea was that there were different ways to uh, purchase what you were using based on how you were going to use it. And that rental car analogy is probably pretty uh, appropriate here. If you're if you're maximizing and, and really driving value out of your existing automation estate, and you're looking at this purely as a cost control exercise, it's probably not the right fit for you. But if that's you as a customer, and now you're asking yourself, well, how can I be more flexible with my growth over time? Or how can I be more flexible adopting new technologies and bringing them into my IA ecosystem quickly? Um, then you might actually be a good candidate for a pay-as-you-go platform. 
that makes sense, Phil. And as you say, if there's a lot of seasonality in, in the consumption, like I do, I have with my fitness subscription here in the winter, then we should definitely go with the pay-as-you-go uh, solution. And Mick follows up on the answer. He said, thank you. So uh, that was uh, regarding this uh, comparison with, with the Camunda. So he said, uh, so cloud deployment only? Yeah, so on the consumed platform, it is a cloud deployment. Um, we, you know, it's a con the C2 core automation and, and management platform that we provide. We provide both in an on-prem version and in the cloud. But for that consume IA platform, the pay-as-you-go model we're talking about here, it's cloud only today. And maybe uh, for those of us who just joined, maybe you can uh, specify what we actually get in this pay-as-you-go subscription in the C2 platform. So um, is that the orchestration or is it everything, the whole suite? Yeah, so in the pay-as-you-go, you get the whole suite. Um, it's effectively, again, what you choose to, to use. So this is an IA platform that's deployed and integrated a number of best-of-breed technologies from RPA, IDP, chatbots, ML, um, tools like uh, natural language processing to be able to parse and extract, you know, kind of sentiment and analysis of data. All of these uh, products side by side, you can come in and you can really pick and choose like you're shopping in the store, uh, which technologies you want to deploy for a specific automation or for your enterprise. Um, at the base layer in this platform, it's orchestrated and managed uh, using C2 as a core product. So as you're building and deploying those automations in UiPath or in Blue Prism, C2 is the effectively the air traffic controller um, that's running in the background there. There's no need for you to purchase that and deploy it side by side with everything else. And then it also comes with that ServiceNow um, service level management capability and the white glove support that sits side by side with it. Um, and when you begin using the platform, when you grow with it over time, again, as you bring new technologies into your automations, as you use more of those technologies, um, you'll see the kind of the billing and usage just coincide directly with how you're uh, interacting with and using the platform. Great. And when we talk about the, the costs of this, because uh, uh, in this model, how can we predict costs? Is, uh, do you have any uh, charge for, for seeing this? And um, yeah, how do we predict the cost in terms of budgeting uh, and financial uh, planning? Yeah, so it's funny because we actually have customers that come to us and they say, listen, I, I, I'm going to spend you know a million pounds on this over the next year. Um, I just want to go ahead and, and basically put that money in the bank up front and just almost like a debit card withdraw it monthly, draw down on my credit month by month as I use it. And we have other customers that say, well, we just obviously want to adopt this kind of fully framed pay as you go model and, and, um, and understand month to month what we're using, what we're going to be charged for and what we'll pay. Uh, when we look at kind of how do you forecast your your costs or your budget over time, again, we can help you look at the utilization piece of it. And um, and you'll have to give us some guidance, a little art and a little science around forecasting what your utilization might look like over the next 12 months. Uh, but then on the on the cost side of it, we can share a very simple pricing schedule with you that says, you know, in February or March or April of this year, when you use 2,000 minutes or 10,000 minutes or 300,000 minutes, um, here is the, the price per minute or here is the price per page. So we can provide that visibility for you. The big, the most important thing for you to understand and, and not misforecast your costs with this program is to be able to predict your utilization. And that means not only what you're doing today, but what you plan to do on the platform tomorrow. And that's the challenge that I think a lot of organizations have with automation in general is not knowing what's that next project that we're going to take through the, the front door application or through our book of work and we're going to deploy and what's the utilization of that going to look like and and then um, you know how do i cost model that so understanding what you're going to do is the biggest precursor to being able to forecast what you know a program like this would cost thank you phil and if we well, compare uh, pay as you go uh, with subscription do we lack any features in in one of the models or is it only the pricing that uh, that differs here no i think you know Again, if you went and you selected and bought and deployed all of those technologies that I shared, we've deployed inside of that IA platform on your own, um, you would have more control for sure if it were on-prem. Because in a SaaS or a platform as a service model, you know, we're owning the infrastructure, we're owning the you know kind of third-party application management, we're owning the the network admin, the sys admin, the network security, all of the typical infrastructure you'd expect from cloud. So in an on-prem model, you'd get some of those controls back. From a technology, apples to apples perspective, whether you're running your instance of Blue Prism or we're running ours, we're running the same code base, we're running the 
you know, the most recent versions of these products. So more often than not, you'll actually be the benefactor of um, using an IA platform like ours because we can keep those uh, those versions of the software products more current and uh, and do so without you having the change management exercises, the level of effort internally to go through the upgrade schedules, to go through the release cycles. Um, code base, same. Great. And Phil, I'm sold. I want to buy C2. Where should I go? And not buy the company, but I want I want to get started with pay as you go um, consumption based uh, C2. Yeah, that's a great call to action. So I mean, the first place to go is our website, c2.com, our YouTube page or our, our LinkedIn profile. Um, through there, you'll find plenty of collateral around the consume platform, around the core orchestration platform. And there are some ways that you can engage with us through there, whether it's requesting a demo, whether it's, you know, kind of looking at some of these case studies that I've shared already in terms of how our customers are benefiting and gaining value from the IA platform, that pay-as-you-go model, as well as just the kind of the core orchestration management platform. Um, the website's definitely the best place to start. You're certainly welcome to reach out to myself directly. Um, I'm always on, unfortunately. I run a 24-7 lifestyle, so I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on uh, Slack, email, everywhere that you can find me. I'm happy to direct you to the right party internally to have those initial conversations, help you better understand, again, what the value of this would be for your business. Um, and if it's the right tool for you, you know, sometimes we have conversations with customers and the best and most obvious answer for them is you need to focus on just building out your core capabilities of automation before you think about elevating the way that you deploy it. Um, for some customers, it's much more focused on you need to get those automations fixed and working now. So let's take a look at that core C2 product and put that orchestration layer on top of your estate, get that running, build the right perception of automation for your enterprise, and then look at expanding into IA with other tech in maybe a pay-as-you-go model. And in many cases, we would look at it and say, consume the C2 you know, IA platform is absolutely the right thing for you to do. And we can help you engineer value into your business case and understand kind of you know, where you are today and what you'll have or be able to deliver tomorrow. Um, I love those conversations. I'm always happy to have them with individuals as well. Great, Phil. And while I um, investigated uh, potential questions for you, we had a question coming up in the Discord community. Carl uh, said, is this supported by the RPA vendors? Is this something that they like that you can multi-orchestrate it or is it just like a hack in quotation mark? Yeah, yeah, no, it's definitely not a hack. It is supported by them. We have to have the licensing to deploy it. So, um, you know, through that through that partnership, we do have the commercial relationship and we have the story with them as well, where we've taken customers who had material challenges with their on premise states, with the way that they were deploying certain platforms or certain technologies, and we've provided better outcomes for them. So the customer success thing is the biggest lever, I think, that the RPA vendors themselves are interested in. And it's not just RPA. Like I said, it's IDP, it's ML, it's chatbots. And for each of these vendors, the most important thing for any vendor in 2023 is your customer satisfaction. It's your NRR. It is, and these are now moving into more like revenue operations terms, but it is, um, what is my relationship with that customer look like over the next five years? Is it improving? Are they happier? And are they using more of us? Or is it is it you know taking a negative turn? Um, where we're able to provide value to our, specifically RPA vendors is by elevating the success of those automation programs so that they end up doing more with Blue Prism, with UiPath, with Automation Anywhere, with Power Automate than they were before bringing C2 into their ecosystem. Um, we have a number of those stories that we continue to tell over and over, and we hear more of them every week as we deploy to new customers. Nice, Phil. Uh, thank you. And while we talk a lot about C2, we saw a lot about uh, this cool multi-orchestration with UiPath, Blue Prism, Automation, Anywhere. We could um, orchestrate all those tools in in the C2 platform. Is there a business case for, let's say, that I'm just a Blue Prism or a UiPath uh, company, or using UiPath and Blue Prism? Should we go? Should we go with C2 if we have a single vendor strategy? Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, multi-vendor, single pane of glass is a fantastic value add for any enterprise that's deployed multiple technologies. But for companies that are using a single vendor, we still provide the same core capabilities that drove them to select us when we were only a Blue Prism technology partner. 
So today, as you look at whether it's A360, Blue Prism, UiPath, each of them has their relative strengths and weaknesses in different areas or domains. Some may be stronger in the orchestration and scheduling than others. Some may have queuing, some may not. All of them have common pitfalls that we provide and that we remediate, whether it is, you know, kind of the self-healing, looking at the automated operations and finding ways to provide better business quality of service, or if it's just simply running the, the work that's in a queue in a more efficient way to deliver back to the business at the, at the levels of agreement and engagement they expect from automation. Um, for any one of those reasons, whether you're using a single RPA technology or if you have a multi-vendor strategy, C2 is absolutely the right technology to be able to provide better automation outcomes. Great, thank you, Phil. And maybe a more general question, like a year or two ago, we saw a lot of uh, like multi these like C2 multi-orchestration companies, but now it seems that it's only C2 in the market. Can you tell us about something? Maybe you can't, but can you tell us something about your market share and how that has evolved during the last years? Yeah, well, I think the interesting thing that you're seeing is that more and more companies are recognizing outside of their automation teams ways to deploy and play with other technologies like, let's say, inside of the power platform, whether it's automate in the cloud or power automate desktop. And as, as these companies are looking at, OK, now I have these challenges of providing a single pane of glass to my controllers, to the automation teams, to understanding what automation means for our business, they have fewer answers today than they did a year ago. So just anecdotally, you know, I had a customer that came to us and they said, the most important thing that I would be able to derive from bringing C2 into my enterprise, it's actually not the scheduling. It's not the automated operations, that level one, level two support. It's a dashboard to take to my CEO and CFO and say, this is what automation has actually done for our business. Because they had no way of taking what they had done and, and costing that out and providing that as a savings statement back to their CEO and CFO. Now, different organizations are at different levels of maturity. For some that are hearing that, that may seem like you know, table stakes and something that any business should be able to provide. Um, they very clearly weren't. And as we started having those conversations, the light bulb went off. They said, wait a second. Not only can I now provide that view of what automation is providing, but I can also take Power Automate and I can let my citizen developers in the field deploy flows and integrate those back into this automation hub that we're providing. We said, absolutely. That's the core value prop to the business is that operational kind of control tower view um, and being able to manage it across the business. So from a market share perspective, we're seeing more companies that approach that multi-vendor strategy uh, that are looking for kind of the holy grail, that silver pane of glass, uh, single pane of glass coming to us and, uh, and really finding ways to engage with us in creative and innovative technology uh, challenges. Um, in terms of what's, what's happened to the market itself and where the different orchestration players are, you know, I, I love conversations like this because I was selling a complimentary, maybe maybe a, a version 0.1 of this you know, back in 2017 and 2018 at a different company. And I think a lot of people took their foot off the gas in you know, the orchestration and management space because they shifted to creating more of kind of that full IA story. They wanted to be able to manage the end to end process or deploy and execute it. And they stopped thinking about the control of it and the oversight of it and the scheduling and the operational effectiveness of it. Uh, that's still a very real challenge for every enterprise. And it's something that we are is very passionate, uh, maniacally focused on and that we do better than anyone else in the business. I'd love to see more people in the orchestration space because then there's more people talking about it. Um, then we have you know, obviously more attention as a maybe a market pattern or a technology quadrant. Uh, but for the time being, we're just going to continue to I think, grow our customer stories, solidify the success of their automation programs. And hopefully I'll be able to come back and share some more of those stories with you and your viewers here in a couple of quarters. We would look very much forward, Phil. We are coming to an end here. I want to thank all the nice uh, viewers. There will also be a lot of viewers in the future. And if you want to get in contact with Phil, you can find uh, Phil on LinkedIn. You can also check out the C2 YouTube channel that will be here in the chat. I will also post it in the description if you watch this session afterward. Phil, very uh, big thank to you. Thanks to all the viewers. And did I forget to ask you uh, one question, Phil? What would that be? Oh, if you forgot to ask me one question. Mm, that's tricky. Um, uh, what my utilization of my gym membership looks like. <laughs> <laughs> Is it as bad as mine? It, well, it's, there's the seasonality for sure. Uh, my yeah. membership is running outdoors, and as it gets colder, that membership is less used. So, yeah. um, so I, I suffer the same play. No, yeah. it's it's been it's been really interesting. I think going through and hearing the questions that you and and your viewers have asked, and you know, I think as we look at where the markets are going, 
uh, you know, the the reality of it is that there are an ever number or an, an, an unending number of different technologies to begin picking up, to begin playing with, to begin integrating into a more complete story. The bigger challenge is not how do we adopt them, it's how do we train our people internally to pick them up and use them um, and to become effective with them. And so I just, to that end, I think I would advocate more for, um, you know, people like you in the space that are creating story and creating, uh, you know, education programs for individuals who want to go through that uh, kind of self-paced journey. Um, I'd certainly welcome recommendations from you to your viewers across the IA space around other, um, you know, uh, other thought leaders that can help answer these questions. And along the way, you know, giving vendors like us the opportunity to spotlight these stories and how we integrate kind of the business users with the technology users and the products. Uh, thanks a lot, Phil. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you here. We will be back with more live shows. And if you want more like this, let's help C2. And of course, you also help this channel by giving this video a thumbs up. That will make the video go out to even more people here. With that said, see you all and thanks for watching. Thank you as well, Anders. Bye all. Bye-bye.